Welcome everybody to BT's Fly Tying Friday. Tonight, it's more of the tough and easy series of flies. We're gonna be focusing on crayfish. Gretchen will be doing an easy crayfish from our book, Easy Trout Flies. It's got a funny story that goes with it. We'll uh, try to remember to share it with you. And I will be tying one called the Snaffle Bit Crayfish. That's a real pain in the backside to tie. And we'll be focusing on the tip area with a few more dry fly tips. Hi, we're the BTs from Boise, Boise, Idaho. And Gretchen, if you're ready to get started. <laughs> I am ready. Let's okay. take a look at the materials. Okay, there's your recipe. And, okay, uh, what we're going to do is we're tying on a 3XL size. <clears throat> I'm tying on a 6. Um, I'm not, you can weight it. However, I'm not going to wait. Instead of waiting, I'm putting on uh, some bell eyes. So that's, that's an option, and I kind of like the way it looks anyway. I'm using brown thread. The shell back is brown poly. The claws are brown marabou. The rib is fine <laughs> copper wire. The body is a brown chenille. I'm using a chenille with a little sparkle in it. I kind of like that. And the hackle is palmered brown hackle, <clears throat> and uh, the tail is the brown poly yarn. Let's take a look at them over here. Here's all of our materials. This is the, the uh, chenille I was telling you about. It's got a little sparkle to it. There's my thread, wire, hackle, marabou. And I've taken the poly and combed it out so you don't have to watch me do that. So I think we're ready to get started. I'm gonna move a couple of these things over here so I can get to them. Okay, I can reach the rest of them as I need them. Okay, let's take a look at do you, at our uh, destination fly. This a little is bit lower. Mm, Pull it in right here. There, there we go. There you go. There's our crayfish. And that's what we're going to be doing. I think on this one, I was messing around with the marabou and I might have gotten it a little long. I don't know. Uh, what happens to when you put the, the bead eyes on, it pushes everything a little <clears throat> bit back. And I think that's the reason it, it looks that way, but I think it would still catch fish. And this is probably not a competition fly. No, it's I a, would say it was a fishing fly. <laughs> yeah, it sure is. And speaking of fishing, uh, as Gretchen gets on the thread base, she tied this for me back when I was guiding in Montana. And she just told me one day, she said, I got through packing my lunch and said, hey, there's a surprise for you in your lunch. You better take a look at it. Well, as things turned out, I, I didn't get a chance to look at it until lunchtime that day when the clients and I had stopped on a little island in the Madison River um, just, well, just out, outside of Bozeman. And anyway, we had lunch and I opened up my lunch and there was these crayfish in there. I said, oh, darn, they look good. We hadn't had a real good morning with the normal brown woolly boogers that we tie the, tied to catch uh, the browns in that particular area. So we tied on one of these and my God, it wasn't 50 yards downstream and the guy in the front of the boat, young kid from, from Pennsylvania, he was into a big one and it was just about spooled him. He was whooping and hollering. And all of a sudden these two girls that had been sunbathing on the high bank right next to the boat stood up and they had forgot to put their swimsuits on or maybe they didn't have them on in the first place. I don't know which, but anyway, they were very stark naked and very good looking. And the young guy just dang near fell out of the boat. I had to grab his belt to keep it from falling out of the boat. And on down the river, we went, lost the fish. Got, on, got further down river, and of course, the young fellow couldn't quit talking about that. He thought it was pretty great. Bottom line is, I've never been able to repeat that day on the river. In fact, in fact that young fellow and his father came back five different years in a row with the hopes of uh, repeating the process. It didn't happen. You know, I so, thought he came back because you were a good guy. Well, maybe that too. But anyway, <laughs> you can get started there. I okay. Got through that story. The, the really thing about this fly is you have to stop and think <clears throat> as you're putting the materials on before you even start wrapping to be sure because it's a lot of materials so I kind of played around with it today 
thinking about, in fact, I woke up this morning thinking about the order of, of how I wanted to do it, what I've done in the past. I haven't tied this fly in a long time till today. So the first thing I'm going to do is put this copper wire on. And I'm going to hold it up here because I want it on the, the uh, backs on the bottom back side. And then the th important thing now is to get it out of the way because it is the last thing I use. The next thing I'm going to put on is uh, the chenille. So get my chenille out. And there again, I used to tie this on the top, but it kept getting in my way. So there again, I'm going to tie it on the bottom of the hook. If I hold this up and kind of to the back side, then the thread torque will just pull it around and put it on the bottom. I want to go just above the uh, throat of the barb. And this too, we need to get out of our way. <clears throat> now I'm going to tie on a feather. Choose this one. This looks pretty good. And this one I'm going to tie to the bottom, but on this side. It's getting a little crowded on the other side. <clears throat> okay. Now, the next thing that I'm going to tie on would be the uh, poly yarn. And the, we want to tie the poly yarn out. And the secret to the poly yarn is you want to keep it right on top of the hook because it's going to come up and over to form the shell back. So, and the other thing that I like to do with this is I'm going to put this towards the front because I kind of I'm going to start kind of shaping a body a little bit. So, we'll so the put waste that. from your materials are shaping the body. Is that what you're doing? Pardon? Yes, I'm using the waste of the materials to shape the body. Oh. Exactly. <clears throat> okay. And now at last, we're going to put on the marabou and I prepared some marabou ahead so it's all ready to go. Whoop. I prepared it and then tried to destroy it when I put it in my hand. So I want this to be one length, the length of the shank and maybe a gap long. So I want it right there. And I want to tie it not as far forward Whoops, let's just do this. Not as far forward as I did the poly. So we'll put it on about here. So let's measure that again. We'll place it. And now we'll do a finger thumb tuck and wrap it to the back. Don't let go of this stuff. And I'm going to hold on to the poly also. And the reason I'm holding on to the poly, as you can see, is if I don't, it has a tendency to let the thread, thread torque pull it to the other side. So, whoops. I'm going to keep it forward like this so that it doesn't sneak around on me. All right. No, I guess that's enough, isn't it? OK. Fine. Now, what you want to do when you clear off the tear or cut off the waste is you want to do a real beveled cut. So I've got it kind of going down lower towards the front to start making a platform more and to form the body. This is the back end of the crayfish. These are the claws. So you think about the body, we want the body to go smaller, larger, larger, larger like that. Okay. Now I'm going, I've got, this is a, these eyes are bead shade that we found one time and we still have a few of them left, not a lot, but I thought I would get those out today because I kind of like the way they look. 
and we'll tie the bead chain on. I'm gonna do some crisscross wraps. Now, one of the thing about bell eyes is they have a tendency to go like that. So the way I kind of stabilize that is if you go down and around the hook, around the hook, or not the hook, the, well, yeah, the hook, the back of the hook. So, and then I like to take a wrap around it to kind of cinch it down. And those are just really solid now. Okay, now I get to start tying the fly actually. The first thing I'm going to do is to wrap the uh, chenille. So let's get my thread up here where I need it. And I don't go through the eyes with my chenille. And the reason is, is because I'm gonna be doing the poly through there and that is plenty. You wanna put these wraps real close together. If you don't, with chenille, if I wrap this not real close like this, you can see the thread and it, it this kind of um, got holes and valleys and it's not real smooth. So when I wrap chenille, I <coughs> force it with my thumb so it's real tight. You get a nice fuzzy body here. <laughs> okay, now let's cut this off. And then I'm gonna unravel it a bit here. <clears throat> so I can get to the thread and push it, push it back into itself. Now you can see we kind of got this body shaped a little bit. All right, the next thing we want to do is to wrap Palmer R feather, just like we always do. I'm gonna push it back a little. However, it's not critical in this fly because we're not gonna have a big hit anyway. But uh, I, I like to do that because you get that back over itself in it. Uh, makes a pretty strong tie-in point. I dampened that just a little bit. It's a little easier to control it if you do. You used a glass of water, didn't you? I did. Yeah, I'll bet. <laughs> well, what else would a lady do? I have no idea. <laughs> okay. Now, when I do this, you're going to notice that these, I guess, are just going out to the side, and that's not the way I want it. And I'll show you how we're going to correct that but we'll take a couple of wraps over this guy. Now what I'm gonna do is take my copper wire and I'm gonna take a wrap in front of, let's see if this is gonna work, work today earlier, there we go. In front of these claws and that brings them more going back instead of to the side. They were really displayed to the side, but now when you pull that down there, you get them more where you want them. And now we're just gonna wiggle this copper wire, take a couple of wraps at the end and tie over it. I probably could have tied my chenille off or my poly off, it would have made things easier, but. And I do cut my wire with my scissors, but I go clear to the back like that to cut it. It's also a fine, a fine soft wire. It's not available on the market. It's actually from telephone ringer coils that when telephones actually rang before they went tweet, tweet and whatever else they do these days. Okay, there we've got them so far. Now what we're gonna do is I'm gonna take a look at this and cut this off about like that. And you've got your tail. <clears throat> And I'm going to whip finish. That is a really, really easy and effective fly. There we go. There's your easy crayfish. And any, he's wild any, and woolly. Any questions out there? 
Any comment about how you fish it? Yeah, how do you fish it? Well, when we were on the Madison, the way I like to fish it, and we'll have to let the guide talk after I'm done because he may have a different opinion. On the Madison River, this was below uh, Bear Trap Canyon. And there the water is a lot slower and wider than it is up higher, like below Hebgen. And so um, there's weed beds that, that are there floating around. And what, what I would do is kind of throw it up on a weed bed and then pull it and let it drop down because the big brown trout kind of hover under those weed beds. And as that crayfish comes down, they nail it. Yep, for sure. Is that how you fish it? Yeah, for the, for the biggest part, the weed beds are, when you're standing in the front of the boat going down the river, you'll see the dark areas. That's the weed bed. And you'll see light tan, almost walkways, if you will, between the weed beds. You just, like she said, cast it up on the edge of the weed bed, give it a jerk and drop it into the tan area between the weed beds and give it a couple of jerks or just let it, let it float for a bit. And if there's a fish in the area, they're into it. You can see I've got some materials there and they're just <laughs> a snarled mess. God, it just makes me shudder to even start this slide. But anyway. But it's a really good slide. The problem is it catches fish like crazy, but it is an absolute pain to tie. And in fact, what we're going to do is we're going to start with the recipe. And I'm going to keep going back and forth to this recipe because everything is arranged here. And all of this has got to be tied on the back of the hook before I can even start tying the fly. So if I... If I miss any of these parts, stop me before I get all the way. You expect me to remember? <laughs> well, we're gonna move. We're gonna move back oh. and forth. Snafflebit crayfish, and it's tied in two sections. We've got the the hook, and it's going to be on a curved uh, two hundred R kind of a hook. Um, thread whatever you want. I'm using brown. The antenna is crystal flash. The mouth, mouth parts are deer hair. Um, the claws are chickaboo. Shellback is brown poly. However, the original was not tied with poly, but we've modified the fly to use that material. Copper wire, and by the way, the copper wire we use is not the kind of stuff you buy in the store. It's from old telephone ringer coils, uh, which, which is a lot finer and a lot softer, but it makes a really good fly tying material. The body is brown chenille, and the legs are, are brown hackle. This is going to be schlopping and before we get into the fly itself, we're going to go to feather school. And let's take a look at a chicken. And on, on the, the chicken here, we're going to talk about where you get certain feathers. We're not going to get real technical, but let me do a screen share here. All right, <clears throat> let me get my pencil out and we'll do a little bit of drawing. Okay, we all know that the cape is right here. And if you didn't know, that's where the cape comes from. The neck feathers, if you will. And the saddle is right in this area. And in fact, if it's a good whiting saddle, it'll be clear down like that. And we're going to talk about this area right here in just a moment. But let's get rid of some of these marks. Control. All right. Another area that we're going to talk about you may not be very familiar with, but it's this area here, and it's the chest breast feathers and the feathers down in the crotch. And in the crotch area, they're called chickaboo, very similar to a miniature version of marabou. Okay, let's just, just so you know, because we're gonna be using some chickaboo here in just a few minutes. Get rid of that. Okay, let's get back to this area right here. Right in this area, in fact, starting right about there, notice the saddle starts here, but right about there, a feather under the feathers you see, that's kind of a buffer zone, if you will, between the outside feathers and the body of the bird, are feathers called schloppen. And they've got a lot of web in them, and, and we're gonna be using some of those tonight. Now, what I cannot tell you is, as we go back here, these feathers right here, and right here slopping and somewhere in this area, they turn into tail feathers. I can't tell you exactly where. All I can tell you is that getting back to right about here, right underneath these feathers is what we're gonna be dealing with because I cannot tell you the number of people that I have given this recipe to and they ask me, where can I get slopping? 
Well, let me get rid of all of this stuff and get rid of the bird and stop the screen share. I need to see that chat. chat. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> and now I'm, uh, I'll get rid of the bird and I'll show you where you get slopping. All right. Let's see. I've got, well, first off, I've got it right here handy. So this is soft tackle and chickaboo. This area right here is from the breast of the bird that I talked to you about. And this is from the crotch area. And in fact, you were looking at it from the side and breast and crotch area. And the chickaboo is right in this area here between the legs. And I'll be using that here in just a moment. I'll... Now, the place you're gonna get slopping is, uh, I've got an old Hebert saddle here. And I, I think it should look familiar to anybody that's got a saddle. It's uh, the feathers that you're all used to tying with. This used to be in a package. And your slopping though is actually located in the back here. These feathers here, I told you that they started at this part of the saddle and then they went on into the tail area. Well, right there, you can see some really soft fibered feathers and that's the ones that you want. Those are the slopping feathers that are still left on this saddle. However, they continue on into the tail area, but you'll very seldom find them on the market. Well, that's a dry fly cape. This is a saltwater cape. It's what I'm going to actually take them from. And let's look at this side of the cape. You can see very well the back side of those feathers that we were pointing out to you are right here. These have got a lot of web in them. They really make great legs on these on these crayfish. And that's what I'll be using is these slopping feathers here. The ones that you often throw away as being worthless when you get through with all the regular feathers on your on your saddle, you should be keeping them. They got some got some good uses. Let's set that aside. Let's see, okay, I have to put, I'm not gonna put lead wire on. I need to get the hook in the vise, brown, poly yarn, okay, claws. Okay, I'll get started with all that. <clears throat> We're over here with, uh, get, get Gretchen's fly out of the vise, set that aside. And I'll bring one of these curved 200R type hooks up. And I'm just going to take a moment first and get rid of the barb. You're not careful with this, you'll stab yourself. And I have a history of stabbing myself while on camera with you all or trying to cut my fingers off or whatever. And so we're, uh, we're going to put the hook in there like that. Now I'm just going to start right here at the end of the shank as would be identified on this curved hook and just put a short thread base there. Now back over in my materials in this mess, I've got some crystal flash. I don't even know if you can see it there, but you'll be able to see it when I get back over to the vise. And I just uh, I pulled it out of the bundle and stuck it in a clip so I would be able to pick it all up. And I'm just gonna take and tie these in the center here. crank it down pretty tight and pull this back over and bind them in place. What I'm doing here is making the antenna for my crayfish. And I want those antenna to be about as long as, well, a little bit in front of the hook. That'll, that's a, just a good way as any to, to measure them. Now, the next thing that comes is probably, let's take a look at a finished fly so you can get an idea of what we're trying to accomplish here. This, this is the, the finished fly, and the way this fly is designed, it is it goes in the water column like this. You got the leader coming in from the, the right-hand side of the picture. You can see that here. I'm wiggling that part of the fly. But the rest of the fly is made buoyant so that as it drops in the water column, it drops like this. It started life on this earth, originally called the fighting crayfish. And if you've ever seen crayfish uh, in a threatened mo mode, if you will, this is the way this guy travels in the, in the water. And he's designed in this front part that I'm wiggling right now with flotation. And all of the sink in this thing is at the back. 
So it, 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 it will drop in the water column in the fighting stance like a crayfish actually does. And when it hits the bottom, it will float. This will be on the bottom, the straight part, and the rest of the bug will kind of tip up off of the bottom. And when, of course, you can imagine as you jump it along, it can be very enticing to a fish. But anyway, I'll just set that guy aside for the moment. You can get an idea where, what the goal is because you'll understand why I am going to be using um, some deer hair. And this is deer hair that's been dyed. So it, the color thing that we talked about in the past is going to be difficult to demonstrate. Just trust me, this hair is spinning hair. It's already been dyed brown. I'm just gonna take a chunk of it, cut it off. And on my way back to the vise, I'm going to get over my waist bin and clean the under fur out. Stack her out and I'll just even all those tips. Now we have, what I'm doing right here is I'm putting in what we call the mouth parts. And, uh, but it's this buoyant deer hair. Well, we've even tied it with, with foam and, and a lot of them we tie do have foam, but I'm trying to stay, stay with the original recipe, but a foam in this area can work really well so that that will definitely float. Now I'm gonna cut this off just like that, but I'll go over my waist bin to get it done so I don't make a mess. All right, and now we're back here and we'll tie that in place. And then I'm just gonna wiggle it around the hook and flare it in place. And that's the mouth parts. <clears throat> I'll just tie this, <clears throat> tie this on because I, right there we go. Now I'm just gonna take two turns of this chenille. and then pull it into my material clip. Now the brown poly goes on the underside of the hook because the underside is actually gonna be the top of the fly. And like Gretchen did, I'm going to use the bulk from the waist of, this, of the next few materials to kind of build up a taper to my body. There we go. And I'm letting thread torque, a tension with the left hand on the material itself and the tension of the thread with my right hand is placing that material on the bottom of the hook. And I'm, I've got a, another material clip over here and I'll just temporarily put that in that material clip. Okay, good. Now it's time to put my wire on. All right, good. Now I'm going to tilt this back just a little bit and get it more even. And now it's just, now it's time to put on the claws. Find all that down. Now the claws are going to be a couple of chickaboo feathers. Now I want, I want to talk about that for just a second because the chickaboo feathers I'm using, when I tie the guy that goes to the river, I put two on each side. That fuzzes up so darn much that you can't see anything after I put them on the hook on a camera. So I'm putting on just singles, one on each side. Yeah, but understand when you tie your own, put on two feathers per side. And I've got these feathers already pulled out. I'll just set, take one out. And you can see now what the checkaboo feather looks like. It's uh, very similar to marabou, but it you notice it's a lot, lot has a lot blunder in here. Those would work good on that easy too. Uh, I would sure, sure would. We didn't have access to these back when Gretchen developed the easy crayfish. But anyway, we'll put that guy on. Just let some of the waste start building up the underbody. <clears throat> I like the color of that too. Yeah, I do too. It's um, now the original one had dyed brown, but we're going to. 
All right, now we'll put it on the other one. I want it to be about the same length, so I'll set it just like that. So you really do need two feathers on each side, you think? Yeah, you sure do, because the way they show right now, oh, no, you don't need two feathers. But when it gets wet, you do. Okay. I've never really watched him tie this. This is kind of fun. Okay, now I've got I've got to go back and check the recipe. <clears throat> brown crystal, deer hair, chickaboo, brown poly, copper wire, brown chenille, brown hackle. I still got to put it on the hackle. Now I can pull that stem back, and I want to see how it kicks the the feather back here towards the back. That's where I want it because that's where my first wrap is going to be. All right, here we go. <clears throat> Now you put one wrap behind the feather. Yep. And the rest have them in front of it. Yep. Okay. Now, just like Gretchen did, I re you really don't want to let that open up. It may even do a fairly good job of covering things by opening up, but you want to really jam those turns of chenille against each other. You get a good solid body that way. And I want you to notice as I get back here towards the hook eye, I stop way short. I do not want to crowd that eye in any way at all because it's going to affect the joint, if you will, or the snaffle bit part of the, of the fly, and it won't bend in the water like we want. Now, I've got a little bit left. That'll probably be enough to finish the fly. If not, I've got some more laying over there. <clears throat> Okay, now it's time to wrap our hackle, legs, whatever you want to call it. All right, good. We've got those. Now I'm going to pull this back just like we do for all of our heads. Make a nice clean, keep all the garbage under the head. By wrapping a jam knot, it goes back and pushes that feather back just like we do on dry flies. And Everything else, see how nice and clean that head is? Or let me turn it so you can see it better there. You can get a nice clean. And we'll just get rid of the waste right there. Now it's time for the shell back. And I can pull this, kind of divide it just a little bit. Like they were talking, you never did do uh, trim those. No, I just I just pulled them to the side for the biggest part. I keep bumping that camera, dang it. <clears throat> Sorry, folks. All right, now I'm going to tie that off. All right, set that down. See how the materials can start creeping forward. It'd be real easy to jam that eye up, and you don't want to do that. Okay, and now the last thing that we do is we bring our rib in, which is really just going to divide the carapace up, if you will, into segments. I'll call them crayfish-type segments. All right, now I'm just going to go ahead and whip finish that. all that down for the moment <clears throat> now we want to go to the next part and that is the flex clip and this is the flex clip now la fontaine when he when he uh, introduced me to the flex clip he uh he found this in a bass fishing store and i can't remember what he said it was used for but anyway, I, I found a bunch of them and I bought 10,000 thinking that I was going to make a killing on the darn things. And it, it didn't prove to, to, to work out that way. But I want <laughs> you to notice that this one sticking right down here indicates 
the bottom of the hook. Well, we're going to put a dumbbell eye on that, like a dumbbell eye like this. And I can tell you, with a camera between you and me and all this fiddling around that I have to do to get that dumbbell eye on, I'll probably drop it in the waste bin. So I'm saving myself the embarrassment and you the wasted time. I've already tied a dumbbell eye on. Then I took my pair of side cutters and cut off. You can see that it's gone. So now I'm going to Now we're ready to <clears throat> move into the second part of the fly. Right, now I need to turn off this part of the recipe and turn on the next part, which is the articulated clip. And we'll be keep moving back and forth between it and the, and the fly. But first I need to move the fly out of... Can I ask a question? You got it, sweetheart. Is there a reason why you didn't clip off that thing that was hanging down before you tied well, I found that it's pretty handy to tie um, against that. Oh, okay. Oh. All right, now it's tilting down here, hill a little bit, but I want you to notice back here, to protect myself, I've rigged up a rubber band and one of these heckle pliers. And it's maybe going to save me from doing a human sacrifice right here on live uh, on the internet. And we're going to start uh, by. So in other words, uh, you're covering the hook. I'm covering the point of the hook with those. You don't need to do that. But if you're adventuresome, I would say you don't need to do that. And if uh, you're not adventuresome, then I don't know. Anyway, first thing we're going to tie on now is the brown poly. And I'll just wrap. Uh, got myself anyway. Let's see, it's, uh, oh, I'm all right. I'm not going to be bleeding to death, so this is good. Yeah, the hook, the point is sticking out a little bit. Yeah, it keeps slipping. I, I probably needed a, a more rubber band. Okay, I'm going to set this back out of my way. And now I'm just going to put on the copper wire. Al? Yes? A little piece of foam stuck over the hook will do it. Good idea. Thank you. That was Paul in Australia, wasn't it? Having there. blood a bit. Oh, okay. All right, now I've got the wire for the rib. And the last thing we're going to put in is uh, chenille. I got just a short piece left here, and it ought to be able to do, it ought to do the job. Now, what you do not do with this is you do not try to tie off the materials in front of the eyes. That will, I guarantee you, you'll have the eye clogged, something fierce. And look at the way that thing is shaped. It's um, shaped a little different than your regular hook. And well, it's gonna cause you a problem. And I should have not tried to use that short one like that. So I am going to show you a little trick of finishing a fly that I ran out of materials and I just need to add some more to it. I'm going to see how I strip that off. And now I'll just go right ahead and tie it in right where I cut off the other one. Leave my thread hanging there and continue wrapping. I had one more turn behind, crisscross between the eyes, and bring the chenille back and tie it off behind the eyes. Now we're going to bring the 
Polly forward, the, the shell back, the carapace, whatever you want to call it. That'll be the, um, not, not the tail of the fly, it'll be the tail of the imitation. Let's wrap our rib or segmentations to the last part of the, of the shell back. Pull that out of the way. Get my whip finish tool. Finish, finish off the thread, hang out, and let me get a, a clip now to grab this so you can see the actual fly and the, the snaffle bit portion. And that gives you the, the posture that it, that, it, that it fishes in the water, if you will. Um, here is a sample of what you could expect, at least in our part of the world. My goodness, that's a big fish. He's he's a he's one of the nicer ones in this particular unnamed body of water. But you can tell by the by the fish by the hook that's hanging in that fish's jaw what caught him. Yeah, it's you can see the the uh, snaffle part there. Yeah, yeah, you can see the snaffle bit. But anyway, uh, that one has been been. Broke terrain, I guess you could say. Okay, here is a common problem we're going to talk about. One of the really great things that Tom Whiting and Henry Hoffman did was get us some incredible grizzly feathers for tying dry flies. One of the things that went by the wayside though was really good quality, grizzly, spiky fibers that you used to get. They were called the spade feathers from the side of the cape that made absolutely great tailing. Well, here is a saltwater feather. I want you to notice that, um, let me pull out the, you can see that there's some pretty good spiky stuff right out here on the end. And just like last week when we were messing around with the partridge, uh, it gets pretty soft back towards the base end. And we're going to use the same concept, albeit uh, on a material a little bit more likely to have uh, something that we use to strengthen um, these fibers and make a dry fly tail, if you will. So I'm going to start out by getting, um, I'll start my thread base on this dry fly right where the wings will eventually go. It's kind of a, dividing point, if you will. And I'll wrap to the end of the shank and back part way. And I'm just gonna pull some of these fibers off of that feather. And the only part that's really good, and I can tell you that's the part right there, that's the good fibers. And you can see it's not long enough to even make a tail equal to the length of the hook shank, let alone what you would normally do with a hackle fiber tail. So what I'm going to do is I want a tail that's about as long as the complete hook plus the bend and everything. And we'll just tie that on. Now there's, there's our tailing material, but I want you to notice let me get my pointer out. Right here, from here to here is the good fibers and from here to here, they get pretty soft. We're gonna strengthen those and do a grizzly brown mix. All right, we'll stand the wings up. Our goal tonight now is to get that shroud in there. And so I'll uh, trim off the excess. I'll do a crisscross between those wings just so they'll set the way I want them. And it, um, well, it overpowers it and you just have a hard time seeing that you even have a grizzly brown mix. 
Now I'm going to start. First, I better put on my grizzly hackle. Now the grizzly will end up starting right about there. And we'll get to that after a bit. All right, good. We'll just get those all bound down. All right, now we're just going to start wrapping our brown back to meet the thread. Leaving some gaps there to fill in with the grizzly. Okay, now here's where we're going to build towards the shroud. We're going to take this feather and tie it to the top of the shank as we work our way to the back of the hook. Now I can, you can see when I bend it back that the ones that are going to support the tail itself I need just a little bit longer ones. So I work my way a little bit further back on the hook shank. And that's going to give me a little bit better support there. Just a little bit further. Now I'm going to break those fibers, break that feather off, excuse me. And you see the fibers left behind. Those are going to right in, in the area where they're going to support the grizzly part of the tail. So we get a a grizzly and a brown mix, though it's a shrouded mix, meaning that it's only part of the tail that's supported. Now I'll get my dubbing on the thread here. And I need just a little bit more dubbing. I'll just pull this on and twist it, pull a little patch of it and twist it in place. Okay, now I'm going to work my way forward through that brown hackle. And then wrap the grizzly to follow. Mixing the two. Second turn, and remember to build our, build our head now two turns anchoring the feather there. Pull this back, wrap a nice thread head. And we'll get my whip finish tool out. And do a whip finish. Notice as I come by those fibers, it's trying to grab them. So I just, if you pause just a little bit as the thread comes by those fibers, it'll often push them out of the way. Pull the whip finish tight, break the thread, break the feather. And uh, there's um, our Adam's wonder wing and we've tied the hackle a little bit different and we used the shrouded tail. Is that the way we always do it? Nope. All I'm doing is offering you options to add to your own tying bag of tricks.